Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Perpetual Chess. So before we bring in this week's guest, I needed to issue an errata for a couple mistakes I made in the interview with Greg Shahadi. Uh, And thanks to everyone who brought this to my attention. Number one, when we were talking about Kiro Alexenko qualifying for the candidates, I had said that he did well in the FIDE World Cup. But of course, it was the FIDE Grand Swiss where he came in third place. I had actually caught that error before. Um, we released the interview, but I didn't really want to re-record it with Greg. So I just put a note in the show description, which is often what I'll do when I make the inevitable and regrettable mistakes like that. Um, but I apologize for that. And number two, when Greg suggested the rule change, um, where if you run out of time and you don't have check and you can be checkmated only by under promoting one of your own pieces uh, regarding the no checkmating material rule, which of course came up in the Carlson for Ferruja blitz game. Um, I wanted to be clear or we should have been clear that 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 was not an issue in the Carlson Ferruja game itself. There was a way uh, for Ferruja to be help mated without under promoting. So while I do think Greg's rule change is an excellent suggestion, it would have not changed the outcome of that particular game. So once again, apologies for the error. We do try to do the best we can here. So certainly don't hesitate to let me know um, whenever I get my facts wrong. Um, So with that out of the way, let's get to this week's guest. So this week's guest is one of, if, you know, a long time ago, we had Tarje Svensson on the, who I called the president of chess Twitter. I think this guy's like the secretary of chess Twitter or the vice president. (laughs) Um, And and he's rising quickly. He is also the chief content officer for Chessable. He is a dad and an improver, a well-read chess fan. um, And in a past, oh, he, he um, composed the theme music for season two, quote unquote, of Perpetual Chess. And he's a former rock star, just for good measure. So Geert Vandervelt, welcome to the show. Thank you. That's probably the longest introduction I've ever received. Yeah, well, <laughs> two minutes of it was me talking about mistakes I made. But but nonetheless, um, yeah, happy to have you on. You've been requested at various times because you've managed to make a lot of friends in the chess world in your time in it. But Gear, I thought that, that we might start by, by you letting us know uh, how you got infected with the chess virus. How did you uh, first get into chess? Oh, um. Man, that's a story that's not that interesting, I'm afraid. You know, just like everybody else, I think, who starts with chess, like your mom or your dad or, or some close family member uh, teaches you the game. So in, in my case, it was my mom who taught us the rules in the game. And then um, probably when I was in, like, fifth grade or something, and then um, we had a chess team in our primary school. So me and my brother... And a bunch of friends played in it. Um, and that's how I learned the game. I, I remember distinctly, though, <clears throat> I must have been like 10 years old or something. And we were we went on a vacation to, I don't remember, some island in the Mediterranean. I live in the Netherlands, so like that's what families do. You know, they go on vacation in, in the Mediterranean. And we, we went on some island vacation. And um, I managed to beat my dad for the first time. And, uh, and then he just didn't really want to play chess with me anymore. And, uh, and so, uh, then it became, you know, like trying to beat other people, but it, it was never a serious thing for me until much later. So like, I wasn't, I never played, uh, chess at a club or read any books or studied seriously or even played online very much until I was like 19 or 20. So like from the time I was 10 until the time I was like 20 was just this, it was just this game that I really enjoyed, but that I, I didn't really, um, play at a let's say more um uh concentrated level okay but you certainly made up for lost time i would have never guessed based on all of the chess books you read you uh when whenever it comes up on twitter you're if we're talking about some book it seems like you've always read it so you've been been pretty busy since then 
I I have from the time I was 20, I'm 40 now, so I've had 20 years, you know. So uh, from the time I was 20 until now, I um I've read a decent amount of chess books. Um mostly though I've I've been interested in the history of chess. I've always loved history and um you know, it started out for me like years ago uh finding out about chess base and and I didn't even know chess base was a program. I just went to the website and like I would just read all the articles and then like go to Bill Wall's uh, website and like just read about chess history. I just thought that was I still love chess history. I love all the stories, I love all the old games and um you know, like eventually I think I must have been like 22 or 23. Uh, I think uh Kasparov's my great predecessors came out and uh I picked up the first part of that and I I was just that's when I really fell in love with the game. Yeah, so many people have have that experience. Um, yeah, the the history is amazing. So, do you have a a favorite player? Alekine. Nice. Why? Why? Just because I still don't understand how he gets the positions to be to the point where he can play those absolutely stunning combinations. I feel like there's no player in the history of chess. That that has managed to play chess that way in that way where like it's just so it's very aesthetic and uh, I, I, that's what I just I love Alakine's games I think the most uh, just for that. Okay, you guys got to get him on Chessable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's not. I, I'm not sure. I shared this uh, uh, this little vi- audio clip or video clip of uh, Alakine speaking. Yeah, and yeah. it was kind of a revelation because uh, his voice is uh, not what you'd expect of a Russian grandmaster. You know, I was expecting some low baritone uh, guy, but he's, uh, yeah, not not what you'd expect. In, yeah, in it's, I, I, I watched that clip when, when you tracked it down, and thank you for, for doing that. And we'll, we'll put a link to it. But, yeah, it's hard to describe his voice in words. But, yeah, it was, was not what I expected. And because, of course, it's it's almost 100 years old, it makes you wonder, is that really what he sounded like? Or is this, like, distorted in some way? It was that BBC interview, right? Yeah, yeah. I think this. I, think I heard about this uh, because um, who did you have on the, on the it show? It was uh, Grandmaster Neil MacDonald. Yeah, and, you, and and he he spoke about his mom, right? Yeah, uh, that's right. Hearing Alakine on the radio, and then I like went to go find this clip, and I was like, "Man, this is crazy! It's actually up. You can find this." Yeah, that the wonders of the internet. One of the great things about chess history. Um, I was, uh, you know, I uh, as we record this, I just recorded the last chess books recaptured with Fisher and Spassky last yeah. night, and it was cool to find um, find some of the, the just the camera footage of like. You know, Fisher getting off the plane, Spassky yeah, playing yeah, yeah. tennis in Iceland, like, you know, the fans in the hall. And of course, in that particular case, if it weren't for Fisher's, um, you know, notorious uh, camera shy um, proclivities, there would be even more footage. But it's still amazing to see stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Paul Fisher, you know, interesting character. I love that book. The Bobby Fisher Goes to War. It's a really, really good book. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot as well. Um yeah, and listeners, um, this will the, our interview gear will actually come out after that. So, listeners, if you haven't already checked it out, you could check out the recap and then decide if you want to uh, get the book, which, uh, as we mentioned in the recap, is available on audiobook, which is definitely a perk for for people listening to chess content. Um, so, gear, we're we got we're going to get to your rock star status later, <laughs> but I first I want to connect the dots for for how you ended up at Chessable. Um. Okay, so I, I, a couple years ago, and this ties into me doing music a lot, um, I've always wanted to spend more time on my chess because the way I was, the way I got into chess was like, it was mid, like I said, like I was in my 20s, and uh, I started taking it a little bit more seriously when um, I was touring a lot and I had a lot of time in the van or like at venues or I was a touring musician and um I would meet this one guy, this uh, singer for this uh, this band, and he was really into chess. And um, you know, I knew how to play, and and uh, we at, at first we were pretty even. And so he was teaching me a couple things, and then I was like, oh, I got to keep up with this guy. So like, he would learn an opening, I'd learn an opening, and like, then we would like play games every time because we would see each other quite often on tours. We would like tour together, so sometimes we would be together on the road for weeks. Um, so then I started studying a little bit, and then. Um, 
you know, years later, uh, after all the touring, I decided sometime in my 30s, like, I want to take a sabbatical year. I only want to, the only thing I want to do is to study chess. Um, so I took that year a couple years ago. I was able to uh, take a year off from touring with my bands and, uh, and I just study chess 20 hours a week or 30 hours a week sometimes, even more. And um, uh, I joined a club for the first time in my life. I think it was like 37 or something that I joined and uh, just started playing. Like I, I think I played the first year that I, uh, I, I started playing tournaments. I played like six tournaments or something and um, took a coach, took lessons. So I got my first FIDE rate, rating, which is still about the same that I have now. Um, and, uh, and that's how I eventually discovered Chessable because I started looking for uh, ways to improve my game. And uh, that's when I found your podcast, actually. And I listened to the episode with uh, John Bartholomew. And then later I also listened to the episode with uh, Christoph Silecki. And they both mentioned Chessable, so I checked it out, and I instantly fell in love with the website. So I became very, very, very avid user of the site. And um, eventually I figured last year around the Olympiad, or actually this is now two years ago, I think. No, 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 last year during the uh, Olympiad of 2018. Oh. Um, oh, yes, almost two years ago now. Wow, time flies. So then uh, the Olympiad 2018 was happening in uh I decided to create my own chessable course and that kind of took off and that got me talking to the guys from chessable and David in, as a thank you kind of invited me over to London to meet up uh, during the world championships. I flew out there. We, we hung out and uh, one thing led to another. And before I knew it, I was working for chessable as a content creator full time. And then uh, pretty soon thereafter, I got a job offer and uh, I've been with chessable for over a year now. Yeah, that's an that's an awesome story. I just want to highlight a couple things. Now, number one, Geert's course course was free, so um, it kind of highlights the uh, principle that often, if you the more you give of something, the more you get in return. So, I mean, it's pretty cool that Gear Geert was just doing this out of love, designed the course himself. And I remember, of course, as a you know ardent chess fan and chess uh, journalist, um, I follow the Olympiad very closely, and I remember that it was really fun that Gear was just pumping out these tactics every day during the Olympiad, and of course, um, led led to great things, led to your work at, at Chessable. But before we we pick that up, now I feel like we got to get into the rock star thing a little bit more. <laughs> so your your biggest group was called um, Black Atlantic, is that correct? Yeah, the Black Atlantic was, and I guess technically still is uh, alive, although, you know, it I'm the Black Atlantic, so if I decide to write any music and record it and publish it as under that name, then uh, then it's alive again. But I haven't played a show or toured with uh, the Black Atlantic in a few years now. Um, but uh, that's one of my main projects. I started out by playing in hardcore metal bands. <clears throat> that's also still the kind of music I also still really enjoy listening to and, 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 and writing. But uh, the singer-songwriter acoustic uh, folk stuff with the Black Atlantic—that's that was my like career, if you will, in music. You seem so mild mannered to be doing like hardcore death metal. You know, like uh, is there like do you take on an alternate persona when you uh, when you get to performing? Or I mean, I guess you say Black Atlantic is more acoustic, but but yeah. generally, but generally, do you? Well, I think. You know, there's uh, I, I just like with with anybody, uh, there's a kind of energy that you have to tap into. And um, nowadays, when I play heavy music, it's it's not like about a persona; it's just kind of like one dimension of the person I am, right? So it's like we all have different sides to us. And um, I love heavy music because it has this really raw energy, and this there's this you know, primal thing to it that I really enjoy a lot. And, and, but it's also, you know, it's kind of like um, sometimes you want to walk around in a beautiful forest and sing about that. And another time you just want to like smash through a wall. So that's metal. Metal is like having the energy and like the folk part is like having a nice walk in the park or something. It's like, I like both. Gotcha. Energy and entropy. Yeah, I guess so. Um. So, so, 
getting back to the to when you decided, okay, I'm gonna um, take time off from music to focus on chess. Was was that a tough decision for you? Was it um, was it like you could make strong arguments for either side, or were you at a point where you felt like you you had to do this? No, it was purely just. I was just so ready to finally like take a year and like just be a hobbyist. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I just love chess. I just never had a chance to really spend time on developing my chess skills because when you're touring a lot, like you might be able to read a book or something, but <clears throat> you need a lot of structure, I think, to do, to become a good player. And I didn't have that in my youth. So when um, you know, by the time I like kind of learned about uh, Jeremy Silman's how to reassess your chess, I was in my twenties. So I, I didn't have any any real basic knowledge of chess. Uh, so I'm kind of t- still like filling in the gaps now, and and that's what I, why I wanted to do it. It was, uh, um, I you know my brother would always go to tournaments and tell me about all these games, and he's even played Anna Rudolph once, like you know, and it's just funny. He had all these great chess stories, and I was always kind of envious. I was like, yeah, man, I, I want to come to tournaments with you and play, and like play that you know play that kind of chess. So. Uh, so now every year now for the past uh, two years we uh, we go to the Grenka Open together and we play there. Awesome, yeah, and it seems like you're you're managing to play a decent amount. Is that right? Yeah, I, I well I, I'm part of a chess club now, so I play on a regular basis. I wouldn't say I play every week, although I teach every week. I teach kids as a volunteer teacher at um, primary school and also at uh, uh, at the chess club. So on Mondays and Wednesday night. Then or uh, when, uh, Monday night and Wednesday afternoon, I teach chess, and then um, every second week or so, like every two weeks, I'll play a league game, and uh, I try to get in get in a game at the club, but um, that doesn't always happen. Okay, and what's going on with with your game? Like, uh, is there a particular aspect of your game that you're working on? Um, what it, What do you think? Um, what is there like a certain? Um, certain goal you have right now yeah well i'm a total opening junkie so i'm always learning new openings um but uh i'm working currently i'm working through uh, 100 end games you must know which we're publishing on chess we're publishing the uh, the video course presented by john bartholomew next week awesome so i i've kind of been watching the videos and uh, and i i started working on my end game uh at the beginning of the year it was kind of like i i'd said to myself last year it's like okay these are the last couple of months you're allowed to like learn a new opening and, and uh, you know stick with your old stuff. But like next year you got to work on your end game. So now I've been I've been studying my end game every day, like working on it a little bit more structured. So I, I put about thirty minutes to an hour a day into into uh, learning more about it. Cool. Yeah, I saw you put the shout out on Twitter that you were going to do like uh, the hundred end games in hundred days, and I, you've got a few people joining you, right? Yeah, it's great. It's great fun, and we're, we're uh, there's a lot of like interaction happening there, and uh, it's fun because now I'm also taking those positions and lessons to my chess lessons, and I'm showing them to students or or even people from my club. Um, yeah, it's just funny how how little club players know about end games and how much of a how important it is really to to win games. You know, we're we're watching the Carlson uh, Jordan Van Forest game right now, and we were just saying earlier before. When the position was uh, where where Jordan was a a pawn up like in an end game like how lost Carlson should be and here we are staring at a position where they're dead equal again and Carlson right. is working his magic somehow so yeah exactly it looks like the streak might survive uh, listeners of course will already know yeah and yeah. gear gear when you put the shout out for the hundred end games uh, you almost got me because <laughs> as regular listeners will know. I'm not working on my chest right now, but I'm a firm believer in how important it is um, to to work on end games, as you say, even though it's not as glamorous or as fun, I think, for a lot of people, myself included, as tactics or openings. And, it, you know, if and when I do get back into playing regularly, that like using Chessable for that book is absolutely 100% going to be one of the things I do. So when you put it out there, I was like, hmm, and then I thought about it, and I'm I'm one of those people who basically... You know, if I were to start studying chess in order to compete again, it's going to have to be either before everyone in my family wakes up or after they go to bed. And either yeah. either way, I'm dead tired and I just I couldn't do it. I was like, <laughs> I can't commit. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. But I mean, it's never too late to start with that stuff. The thing about it is like I, I when I started doing it, I was like, OK, this is going to be a grind. It's going to be heavy. And like 
I'm not going to enjoy it, but I'm actually really enjoying it. And I'm really enjoying learning some of the geometry and some of the ways that like that certain positions have to be played and I'm enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would. And, and you know, who knows, maybe I'll become an end game junkie in the end. Like I'm really, really, really liking it a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think if you can embrace it, I've had, I mean, it's not, of course, because we asked, you know, a hundred strong players for chess advice, you get one problem. And, and when Jan, when Jan Gustafsson came on and he was talking, kind of saying, uh, you don't need to do studies and stuff. And people didn't know if he was serious or not. I think the yeah. broader point he was making is just that um, you can get anyone to advise anything in terms of chess improvement. Like there'll be one, sure. there'll be one person saying you've got to do end games and there'll be another person saying you've got to do openings and so on and so forth. But I do find the, the argument that any, any game can end up in an end game. Um, you exactly. know, um, and because it's not as fun, it can give you a competitive advantage more so than studying X opening that will only come up what percentage of the time. Now, of course, you mentioned you're an opening junkie. You love openings. You also should do yeah. what you enjoy. So you've got to find yeah. the right balance. But I do think uh, I do. I do still, you know, keep up with a little bit of the opening stuff. But um, I mean, there's only so much time in a day, right? I'm, I'm a dad. I have three little kids at home. I already spend way too much time on chess anyway. Uh, so, and, and then I, it's also my job. So at a certain point, like, it's like, you gotta kind of make set priorities. And so right now I'm just working on the end game stuff and all the other stuff is just, you know, I, I always enjoy doing tactics, but, um, I, I feel like it, it's nice to go through when, when you're, when you're training, it's nice to go, the kind of put the focus on one particular aspect of your game for, for a little bit. Yeah. And it's not a bad idea because whenever I do think about coming back, I just find it. So the idea is overwhelming to me because it's like, well, I need to work on this. I need to work on this. I need to work on this. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it makes sense to maybe just say, okay, this isn't going to be perfect, but it's clearly better than nothing. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned your, your role at Chessable. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's cool that you're making a living from chess. Um, definitely, uh, an inspiring tale and you've just been elevated to chief content officer. So congratulations on that. Um, Thanks. and what is that? Like, I'm sure there's people wondering, what does that mean concretely? What you wake up each day? What, what do you do? Mm, okay. So, um, the title was more of it, uh, you know, it came with a little bit of a, a raise, as well, so it's more of a thank you uh, by, um, you know, the senior management of Chessable and like the David and and everybody for the past year uh, that I put in, and uh, it was more of like a recognition of uh, the difference that I've made in um, the content creation process and the uh, the planning and and just making sure that we're running a tight ship with that, um, but. Um, it's with the idea that in the future, my um, uh, the work that I'll be doing for Chessel is going to be a little bit different as well. Uh, but right now, I'm just I'm doing the same thing. So, what does my work entail on a daily basis? In in, in a nutshell, it's I basically am responsible for any content that's on Chessable. So I keep in touch with all the authors. I keep in touch with the publishers. You know, I arrange for my content creation team to stay on task. I uh, delegate, you know, who has to do what by which deadlines. Um, I pick new ideas for courses. I come up with new ideas for courses. Uh, I review the content that comes in, and then I assign sign it to the right people. Uh, I also do a lot of uh, uh, marketing work, help write the copy. Uh, I create a lot of the course artwork. Wow. Uh, yeah, but it's just a lot of this stuff. It's, you know, everybody at Chessables kind of has like multiple responsibilities, but basically anything content, that's me. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, when I saw that picture of, uh, I think it was you who tweeted it out, uh, it was like you and Sam Shanklin when you guys were working on your video course and it was yeah. like a, a, a bottle of wine or something and some sort of uh, Dutch pastry. Is that, is, that what, <laughs> is that what was in that picture? Oh yeah, I, I I posted a picture of Sam when he finished filming uh, Small Steps, uh, one or two. I don't remember which one. I think it was two. It was fairly recent. Okay, yeah, yeah. So so uh, so Sam came over um, to film the video course for Small Step Two, and uh, then at the end, uh, he treated himself to a couple of like uh, 
Dutch beers and um, and some cookies or something. It was okay. just like kind tough, of fun. Tough, yeah. tough job, dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's where you know, like Sam's a workhorse. He's an incredible workhorse. Like he's already uh, working on the next chessable course, like a chessable original course, and uh, it's uh, already in beta. It's being tested, and um, I have to say, like, there's only a couple of guys who work as hard on content creation that uh, that i've worked with and, and sam's up there he's of the past year out of anybody like he's he's top three wow uh in like work work ethic he's seriously like somebody will leave a comment on the course and have a question for him and like in like two hours the he's answered it and updated the course and like he's and he really did a thorough job so we're really impressed with him just all around all the time yeah, that's amazing. Although not wholly surprising, given first of all his chess uh, accomplishments, but also sure. just how well received his books have been. Yeah, you know he's fantastic, and he and he's a really nice guy to work with. Um, I know a lot of people like sometimes find him very direct, but I, I find that really refreshing, and I, I have a really good connection with him. So um, yeah, I really enjoy uh, every time Sam. Uh, he's coming over in a couple of weeks. I'm. I'm really looking forward to, to having them over again. Excellent. Yeah. And um, in terms of other things cooking up, I, you know, I had heard some rumors that you guys had some top players coming and then I was reading new in chess and Wesley. So, I mean, I don't know everything that you guys have cooking, but, but Wesley, so mentioned uh, he's working on a Fisher random course. I guess that's no longer a secret. Mm, no, that's not a secret anymore. Uh, yeah. He's going to do, he's coming over in a couple of weeks um, to uh, film. So as you know, and as uh, anybody who's been kind of following the chess, you know, uh, Wesley beat Magnus Carlsen in the Fisher Random World Championship. Um, so I thought it would be really fun to have him do the first ever um, Fisher Random st Strategy and Tactics course on Chessable. And I, it might actually be the first ever, you know, strategy and uh, tactics course on Fisher Random in general. I, I know there's, you know, some stuff published on it, but it's not. It, it's usually in the realm of like an introduction to Fisher Random chess kind of stuff, or or some like real hardcore Fisher Random guys like theory stuff. But this is this is more of a general strategy course in in how to play these positions and and to kind of work your way towards getting positions where you understand the plans and understand the tactics. And so um, yeah, I'm looking uh, and, he, and he annotated quite a few games for this. So uh, and he's going to present those games and present the ideas that he had while while, while working his way to become a uh, Fisher Random World Champion. That's awesome. So. Yeah, and we should uh, for anyone unclear, Fisher Random and Chess 960 are the the same thing. Um, I, I think there's a push to change it to Chess 960. I personally, I, I just reflexively call it Fisher Random all the time, but um. I guess the official name is Chess 960, and of course he is the world champion. So that's that's amazing to have him working on something like that. Yeah, it's uh, it, I'm really looking forward to uh, to having him in the studio and uh, seeing what he can, what I can learn from him, and while he's while he's filming the the material. Yeah, for sure. I mean, guys like that, the the way their minds work is just, I mean, it, it's it's something to behold. Um, so what else is is happening at Chessable that we should know about, Gear? I know. Uh, I, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I know. Well, there's a couple of things. There's a, there's a lot of new content coming out, obviously. Uh, one of the most important changes is that we're doing away with Lifetime Pro, um, <clears throat> which uh, anybody that's already a Lifetime Pro or already a pro, you know, they know that um, we have some things in store for them that uh, uh, is, is going to be nice. So Lifetime Pro, um, you know, it's the last month starting... Uh, this week, so I guess by the time the episode comes out, it'll be it'll be underway. So we will have one more month of uh, of uh, pro being available for a lifetime for um, I believe it's two hundred and fifty dollars off the top of my head, and uh, after that, it's uh, it's gone. Um, and uh, it's gonna the thing that we're gonna give pros is um, whoever gets uh, a pro will be able to get. 15% discount from now on on uh, selected courses on Chessable. And eventually, we want to be able to offer it to uh, pro members uh, on the entire catalog that we have up on Chessable. So it's a really cool development that we can finally like offer something like that to um, to supporters of the website. <clears throat> but we also have some other things in store for, uh, for pro members that are really cool. But I can't reveal all of the new changes. 
But the reason for this is that, um, you know, when we, when Chessable was starting out, uh, it was a really easy way for Chessable to kind of raise cash and, and fund projects uh, by having the, this lifetime pro deal. But it's a little bit too good for to be true. So uh, we're, we're keeping it for a month and then we're one more month to give everybody a chance to get it. And then we're, we're getting rid of it. Um, so that's one, that's a really big thing for us. Okay. Let uh, me, let me hop in before, before you, you, uh, mention a few more. Yeah. So just, just to clarify, like, uh, CEO David Cramley, when, when he came on the show about a year and a half ago, he actually specifically mentioned that that deal was too good to be true, referring to the, the lifetime pro membership where instead of paying, um, a monthly fee to support and be a member of Chessable and have access to more features. You actually just pay up front. Uh, but if you did the math, it was kind of a slam dunk no brainer if you're planning on studying chess for even a couple years. So exactly. So get it while you can, guys. There's a month to go. This is this is your fair warning. Um, and uh, what else is coming here? We have a lot of really good content coming. Um, we are also like I I can kind of reveal a couple of things. Maybe I can give a couple of, of um, courses that I haven't really mentioned in the publishing schedule yet. But um, we have a uh, um, a Slav repertoire coming by uh, Grandmaster Alex Chulevich. We have a, uh, a, a full a repertoire against E4 coming by Grandmaster Hare Krishna. Wow. Um, we That's have amazing. a... Uh, all of those are in the in our. We have a new series called Lifetime Repertoires. So uh, we have a Lifetime Repertoire Slav. We have a la- Lifetime Repertoire Semi Slav. We have a Lifetime Repertoire uh, Taimanov Sicilian. We have a Lifetime Repertoire Carl Khan coming. Um, we are working together with uh, former world memory champion Simon Reinhardt, and that's a really special course which uh, I can't reveal too much about yet, but he's developed a method that you can uh, use to memorize chess openings uh, in a way where he's basically applied this method of memorization um, into uh, specifically to learn chess openings. And uh, we're working on creating a course with him. So later this year, we're going to be publishing a uh, his method alongside with the specially developed chessable material. Uh, wow. That, yeah. sound, that sounds really cool. Do, did, really did, cool. Did Simon have any, what was his awareness of chess when you guys contacted him? Oh, he's very aware of chess. He contacted us. He's oh, been in wow. touch with us for a while. And uh, actually, he started playing chess not too long ago and his debut... Uh, rating was twenty two fifty. Oh my goodness! Eight. Oh man! <laughs> so he he's a very strong player already, and uh, he can do stuff. You know, obviously, when you're a world memory champion, you have some serious uh, skill in uh, you know. But it's hard. It's been a lot of hard work for him. He's actually there's a Netflix documentary I think called Memory Games on Netflix, and he's he's one of the four main protagonists in it. Wow. And uh, you, so you can see what, what it entails to do that. But basically, he's applying the method of the loci where you're you're using, you know, a visualization skills along with uh, this this method of uh, converting images into uh, in your know, memories into imagery. And he's applying that to the chessboard. So uh, that's uh, and he I, I, obviously when we had these talks, I I dug a little deeper. I'm actually really interested in this because I, I, I also read that book, the uh, Moonwalking with Einstein book. Yeah, fun book. Uh, and uh, and I tried to learn some of those methods, and, and I was able to, you know, do do some of the stuff that they recommend where you're learning how to memorize, like, X amount of digits in, in short amounts of time and stuff. And it really works. Um, and so Simon applies this to chess, and it was interesting. Like, so I dug a little deeper because I wanted to know, like, are you for real? Like, is this like actually this is actually work? Like, how would you do it? What's the process? And like, we had a couple of sessions, and then I was convinced that it was going to work for Chessable. So wow. I'm, I'm excited for that one. Uh, oh, there's so much more content we've got coming. There's some stuff I can't reveal yet, but yeah, uh, I, I Chessable is going to have really good stuff coming up this year. Excellent. Um, 
Yeah, well, before I try to probe you a little bit on that, so I got to get a little more detail on this this first rating of twenty two fifty. So has he been doing chess online for years? Is it one of those cases, or did he just like roll out of bed and he's a twenty two fifty? Like, is he like Alpha Zero? You teach him the rules and he plays himself for four hours and then then he's a twenty two fifty. I think I honestly don't know much more about it other than um, I think he can like you don't want to have an opening battle with him basically because. <laughs> okay. he, like he just he will kill you in openings. Right. Like if you he can he can probably learn openings at like, you know, alpha zero level. But then you know once you take him off the beaten path, that's where he's probably got a lot of room for improvement. But but he obviously knows his chess. Like he's definitely been into chess for a while and loves chess and is also knows the culture. So it's not like it's not like uh, some sort of. Uh, uh, thing where he wants to prove himself. He just loves chess, and okay. uh, and, he, and he just wants to help chess players become better. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, gear. Uh, we have a few questions from a supporter of the show, but first, let's take a quick break. Guys, since Gear and I were talking 100 end games, you must know. I just wanted to remind you that it is available on chessable.com. It's only 20 bucks. It is an excellent way to learn your basic end games and beyond. The Move Trainer software, of course, quizzes you and makes sure that you know the Lucina position, the queen versus pawns on the seventh rank, and stuff more advanced than that. It is a great way to sharpen up your endgame skills. So head over to chessable.com and check out 100 endgames you must know. Back to the show. Okay, so Gear, um, Augusto Ryuba, uh, supporter of the show, was nice enough to send in a, a list of excellent questions, which I think he was piggybacking a little bit off of uh, uh, David Cramley wrote a blog post slash email sort of summarizing some of the big things happening at Chessable this year. Um, yeah. So this is what Augusto said. Um, he says, it's been great to rediscover Chessable after a few years as I have finished two chess books in three months compared to buying tons of books in the past three to four years and not finishing any. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Uh, he, sure. says, he says, my questions below. Um, number one, iOS app. When does Chessable expect to have the app ready? We all know it's in the works, but a time frame would be much appreciated as it will be excellent for us to commute. Uh, what is holding up the development of it? So let's start with that. It's uh, the the answer is uh, we're hoping to release it in April. Uh, Move Trainer 2.0 is going into open beta next week, so that means that anybody uh, interested can uh, can try out the new Move Trainer. Uh, so, and what is Move Trainer? Well, we're basically talking about that which makes Chessable Chessable. So uh, it's what's underneath the hood of the website and what makes the algorithm work. That's what we, you know, that's what we call Move Trainer. So the thing that you can train with on Chessable and which that trainer training program, which you can customize, we call it Move Trainer. And um, uh, once we've released 2.0 on the site, we'll be set for like the next five to ten years to come because it's been uh, rewritten from scratch, and that's what has been taking so long is that when Chessable first started, David basically wrote like a basic code and then kind of just stacked on top. So every new feature and every new idea that he had or that was, in, you know, was asked by the community, he would just kind of build on top of it. But eventually when you work that way, you know, you get this kind of hybrid of all these different things and it, and it becomes really messy. So about a year ago, he really wanted to rewrite the whole code from scratch and work with a development team. And that's what they've been working on. So once 2.0 is implemented, we can move much faster. And like that's when the floodgate can open for all these new feature requests. And we can really start customizing the site and do lots of new changes. So hopefully come April, we'll have it out. And uh, then it will also be available as an app. That's excellent news. Yeah, I, I look forward to that as well. Um, number two, this we alluded to a little bit, but... Um, uh, Augusto asks chess art type alternatives. He says, I've been doing primarily tactics books and as is common with tactics, there is more than one response. So was wondering whether certain course should include alternative moves that the student needs to resolve in less time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that I think we can improve uh, about the move trainer is that, uh, you know, now when people make an alternative move, <clears throat> we call them a soft fail. So, 
uh, they're not asked to then play out the tactic, but it's the trainer just asks you to find the correct move according to what the best possible move is in the position, uh, as decided by the author who picks what the move is that needs to be played. Um, but, you know, like a program like CT Art, which I think w- is what uh, is being referred to here, it makes you play through the various alternative moves and also play out the various, like, sub-variations of a tactic, say. And um, that's something that once Move Trainer 2.0 uh, is up and running on the site, that's something that we can start implementing. It's one of my personal, like, big requests to uh, make, like, all of the alternative variations in a tactic also trainable so that you can really, like also show and also train that you understand when somebody make, makes, let's say, the subpar move, how to punish it or how to, like, solve the new position on the board. Interesting. Wow. So much, you know, it's it's amazing how, how nuanced it can be. Like, you know, you start with this sort of broad-based idea of space repetition and, uh, you know, a better way to learn openings. But then it, it just between the Fisher random and the end games and the uh, alternative solutions, there's just so much that, that can be added on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, the, that's the goal. The goal is for it to be the best possible customizable tool for your chess studies. So, and then, you know, alongside with the, the science-based learning that hopefully, you know, by the end of 2020, we'll have the best possible thing you can think of to improve your chess. Okay. Uh, number three, Augusto asks about total time. He says, I have this, I have seen, uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, there's kind of a typo here, but he says there's several threads that he's been in and several of us that use Chessable would like to know how much time we spent in a day, not only in a session, which is currently shown or the number of points. Yeah. Well, that's another one thing that once move trainer 2.0 is, is released in, into, into the, uh, the public domain, then, um, or I should say, like once we've put it up on the site, uh, then we'll have more advanced data statistics and and features coming, and we'll th- that's when we can implement those. But uh, like to implement them now would kind of be like putting in work for something that we're gonna out you know, phase out like pretty soon. So gotcha. we've been holding off on all this stuff until Move Trainer 2.0 is is, is implemented. Okay. Um, and number four is this is the last uh, the last question: Kickstart funding. We all know now that Chessable has joined Team Magnus, um, but it is unclear how much funding they're providing. Certain books are very popular in the chess community, and I'm sure that if you use Kickstart to pay for the cost of converting books into Chessable courses, um, that's the end of it. But I guess he's saying it would be popular. If, if yeah, it's been. not. It's not a. We're not constrained by funding or anything. It's it's not like we don't have the money to to. Uh, uh, get the licenses for the books. It's a matter of time. It's just it's a lot of work to do it right, and uh, we can't do all the chess books all at once. Um, we got to do them one by one and <clears throat> convert them in a way that they make sense. And it's also a learning curve. You know, like each new book that we put out on Chessable gets a lot of specialized personal attention because, well, it's not easy to take something that was originally written in a print form and to then translate it into the move trainer format. So it's, it's more a, a matter of time and, um, and not so much a matter of money. It's more like uh, we just want to make sure that as we're growing, we can hire the right people. And as we hire the right people, then we can take on the next project. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's been great to see you guys hiring people, um, um, within the chess community like yourself. And now Mike Zelazny is doing some programming for you guys too. Yeah. Mike's, uh, Mike's working, on uh, uh, doing some, uh, some, uh, development work on the, uh, the, on our coaching platform. Awesome. Yeah. And of course, Dimitri Schneider, who I, I gather was an early investor, which I had, I had, you know, I known Dimitri for a long time. He's an I am, uh-huh. um, you know, from, from my neck of the woods, but uh, I had only put that together, like, uh, just from his, his interest in chessable over time. And then, <laughs> and of course I know that he's old friends with John Bartholomew and then, yeah. uh, and then, uh, lo and behold, he's, um, moving from Hong Kong and based in London now. So shout out to Dima. That's, uh, that's great to see as well. Yeah, 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 and he's getting back into chess. He just played his first uh, first tournament games uh, uh, this past weekend. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we we won't yeah, mention really the is. we won't mention the result, Dima. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he wants to be reminded too much of him either. <laughs> we've we've all been there. Um, okay, talk um, back. Yeah, 
So speaking of Diego's question about, um, you know, some, he alludes to some, some famous chess books that are often requested. Do you have mm-hmm. like a, um, a white whale that you're chasing in terms of uh, your dream chess book that you haven't been able to bring to the platform yet, but you would like to? How to Reassess Your Chess by Jeremy Silman. It's got to <laughs> it's got to be on Chessable. Yeah, I had a feeling based on our interactions that that might be uh, that might be the answer. Yeah, that's my absolute favorite chess book. It changed my whole chess. So I I I, I listened to the episode too, and I couldn't agree more. That's a a brilliant book for any chess player, especially if you haven't if you don't have the fundamentals down, then you need to get that book and just work work your way from start to finish. Because you can learn so much from that, so I want to get that on Chessable, um, but uh, I think we need to wait. What part of the reason why I haven't pursued it is because I'm waiting for Move Trainer 2.0, and once it's once Move Trainer 2.0 is there, I think we can do some things with how to reassess your chess in the Move Trainer format that will make it extra special. So I'm going to pursue it once we once we have that launched, and uh, then uh, then I'll do that. Another really big one for me would be the steps method, and I've actually been in touch with the author of steps to see if we could if we could get steps to chessable, but uh, he's uh, not interested. He's a uh, pretty anti-computer, so he he's still holding off on on bringing you know on giving the giving any sort of digital platform the rights to use steps. But steps would be another one. So how to reassess your chess and steps. Okay. Yeah. D- d- excellent choices. I can't blame you. So it sounds like, I mean, uh, Jeremy Soman, as we talked about briefly, um, when we recap, reassess your chess, he's not, not as, um, not as online as a lot of chess people. So it may take some wrangling, but if you, uh, you know, if you, I will fly out to the United <laughs> States or Japan or wherever he's, he's hold himself up and, and try and connect with him if that's what I need to do, but it's my Holy grail. So excellent. It, 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 you know, I'm going to go to the source and he's going to have to tell me no in person. Okay. That, that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Um, okay. And gear, another thing I wanted to ask you about um, is there was a thread a while back on Twitter. You know, this pops up every once in a while. The the question of uh, the best resources and apps for kids. Um, and yeah. it, it turned out that as a chess dad and someone who's now making his living in the sort of chess education, chess learning field, uh, that you, you had a lot to say about this. So, um, you know, what advice would you give for all the teachers listening and parents listening? What, what do you think are the, uh, the best tools for kids um, learning chess? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I tried out a lot of different ones um, for... My absolute personal favorite at the moment is Magnus Trainer because I think they have the best mini games. The interface is really friendly, um, and um, the gamification is really good. So I just and I personally I I really enjoy it too. So it's it's the app that I would recommend the most is is Magnus Trainer. Um, yeah, you put yeah. me onto that. I didn't have that until you recommended it on Twitter, and I got it and I did love it. Um, but I didn't see it on a uh, iPad. I could only get it on my phone. Do you happen to know if that's still the case? I know. I'm not sure if it's not available on iPad, but I know that they put a lot more development time into the iOS app than they are doing currently, putting time into the um, the Android stuff, and it's because their um, iOS users have grown so much more than the, uh, the the amount of Android users. So I okay. think the iOS app is uh, is the one that they've been putting the most effort in and probably on the phone. I, it's probably a matter of allocating their resources, right? Like they have only so many developers and people working on, on this app. But um, I mean, I have it on my phone and my son plays with it. Oh, um, actually, my son and daughter both play with it almost on a daily basis. They love all the mini games and they love the lessons and the material. It's, yeah, the, it's really fun. Yeah, the mini games are fun. And we should say, like, you, you recommended this even before uh, Magnus's company had acquired uh, Chessable and Chess24. This was not um, not just a business recommendation on your part. No, right? no, no, no. I, I love the app. I tried a lot of different ones. Um, and uh, um, the reason why I like Magnus Trainer is because I the, there were, you know, every diff, every single app, they all have their different... Um, approach to it. So I also, you know, I also have Chess Kid, for example. I, I've also actually um, 
used some of our uh, beginners courses, the Chessable beginners courses, with some of my students because I teach kids like from uh, like for five years to ten years old in uh, grade school and at my chess club. And I've tried all the different kinds, and um, you know we have some catching up to do with Chessable and making more content for beginners accessible, and also making the interface a little bit more uh, kids friendly because it's very much for the uh, the little bit older kids, say like from eight years on. Um, but for like absolute beginners and and like little kids, I think the Magnus Trainer is fantastic. Uh, uh, I also really am a big fan of the uh, of Chess Kids uh, illustrations in the movies that uh, my client has made. Yeah, they're just really great to watch. Very instructional. I actually learned a lot from watching those videos myself. Um, so now you know I'm not speaking as a Chessables publishing manager or CCO, or however you whatever title, but uh, I'm a big fan of interactive. Uh, apps and uh, those are very good uh, for kids yeah and speaking of um, the steps method have you tried out their CDs that they have available for step one and step two uh, I know I actually I, I've never I've never tried those okay. but I know that it's kind of similar to the books except you know in a digital format it's almost like chess based quizzes I guess yeah, although they do have some mini games too. So there's kind of some overlap with the Play Magnus app as well. But similar huh. to the Play Magnus app, it's not accessible. At least, again, last I checked, uh, we'll do another errata if I'm wrong. But it wasn't on iPad when I looked for it. Um, and the steps thing is only on PC or it might be on Mac too. Yeah. But, but it's only on yeah. computers, which, you know, yeah. in, the, in this day and age can be a, a hard sell for converting kids in particular. But. But yeah, that's worth checking out as well. And I guess, as you say, that's unfortunately about as digital as steps may get, at least in the near future. Yeah, well, the, well I had a long conversation with uh, the steps author and, uh, well, the one living author still. And um, part of the reason why he said he doesn't want to publish it on a digital platform is because he feels that the uh, the role for the uh, instructor is so important in in the flesh instruction, like somebody being physically present with the student. And he felt that it can never be replaced. And so he's very apprehensive about um, putting it on digital platforms. Now, of course, I don't necessarily agree with him about this. I think there's a, we can do a lot nowadays with, with chess platforms and we could actually alleviate a lot of his, his concerns, but it's his content. So what can I do? You know, hopefully I can have another conversation with him sometime and convince him to uh, maybe try it out anyway. Yeah. And um, I'll be interviewing another um, prominent steps instructor, not uh, Cor van Weigarten. Why? <laughs> you got to help me with the Dutch pronunciation here, Geert. Uh, Cor van Weigarten. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt that, but <laughs> but obviously uh, his, his work speaks for itself, but not, not him, but I'll be speaking with another t uh, Dutch uh steps instructor soon so maybe we can dig into that a little bit oh, as great. well um okay gear i think we've hit all the major topics on my outline so but we got to talk some uh you're headed to tata steel soon yes yeah i'll be i'll be going over there next week uh, for sure i can't quite make it there this week because uh i still also work <clears throat> as a uh a coach with the young musicians so um i help them professionalize still this is like a little bit of a part-time gig a little bit of a passion so um, so, uh, this week is, uh, the, uh, Eurosonic music festival, which takes place only 25 minutes away from my home. So I'll be going there every evening, watching the new up and coming talent play and helping some of the talent that I've been coaching on the side, uh, to, uh, you know, do a good job and in, in getting out there so that they can have a really great 2020. But then as soon as that's over, I'm going to go to Vikings a couple times next week and, uh, yeah, I plan to be there for the Carlson uh, Ferruja game for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. And um, I want to go. Kind of, I always I try to go every year uh, in the final weekend because that's when it's most exciting. And that's when there's a lot of energy in the room, and so I'm going to go check that out too. That's and, awesome. Uh, yeah, one of our authors uh, uh, that works with us, uh, Christoph Selecki, he's actually there now for the. Uh, he, he's been there for the, and he's going to be there until the end. Uh, and he has like a little house by the sea. And he's while he's working on a new chessable course. So I'm going to visit him and we're going to hang out for a little bit and watch some chess together. That sounds awesome. That sounds pretty good. I, I have to follow up just out of curiosity. Um, 
all the, all the you've <clears throat> learned about uh, memorization in terms of um, what you mentioned about the memory champion that you spoke with, and of course your yeah. work for Chessable, are there are you finding um, actionable advice that you can bring to the music world in terms of the music consulting you're doing? Like uh, like people memorizing songs and stuff like that. Um, is there any parallel there, or not really? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I've never really considered this. Um, the one thing I can say that, uh, with regards to that, is that um, in both music and in chess, uh, what I have learned is that you build up a database of sorts, of and you so you start to recognize patterns. So once in chess, once you've studied a certain amount of games, and once you've studied, you know different kinds of patterns in, in, in um, I don't know, you know, checkmating uh, patterns, for example. And once those have kind of like become subconscious to you, then you can start applying them and you can start looking for them. And it's the same with music. Like songwriting is very much about understanding how things work and how things fall into place. So structuring songs and deconstructing songs into um, parts and then putting them together in a new way, there, there's a very big similarity in the way that works in the sense of, like, I can, I've can i pl played music since, you know, like, full-time since I was 19. So if somebody now, like, is working on a song and they're not happy with the way it's structured or something, for me, it's, like, second nature. I can instantly say, okay, the problem's here. Like, this is what you need to do to unknot like to make sure that this song works better and or this is what's missing for example mm -hmm. and you're missing this element and that's why the dynamic in the song doesn't work the way that you want it to and i feel like it's the same with like in, in that sense there's a big comparison between chess and music is that both have this kind of structure in them and so you know i'm i'm obviously not a grandmaster at chess but i would say i'm a grandmaster at songwriting mm -hmm. so in that sense like there's a that's like uh, what I've developed over the past 20, 25 years is like I can I can look at a song and instantly tell what's going on. And it's I feel like there's a, a lot of similarity in the pattern recognition aspect there. Oh, interesting. Huh. OK, well, get in gear. Um, so you're you're knee deep in chess now, um, playing a lot, bit, very busy with chessable, got your kids playing. Um, what do you think the status is of, of your music? Would you think you'll get back to, to touring at any point or? Um, not sure. I um, I still am involved in music, as you heard. Like I still work with young musicians, like coaching them. It's a side of sort of a side gig. I've done that for over ten years. Uh, I still play in bands. I have like three active projects that I every once in a while rehearse with or rewrite new songs with. Um, but uh, I'm just really happy to be in chess and to have made the switch into chess. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to stick around here for a while. And, awesome. uh, you know, maybe by the time I'm 50, I'll, 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 I'll want to do uh, some sort of reunion tour or something. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. But, but the, the touring lifestyle was pretty heavy. And I, you know, I'm 40 now. My kids are getting older. Like my, my oldest daughter is going to be 10 soon. So I want to I want to be around here. I, I like, you know, leaving the office at five and walking over to my house and seeing my kids and going on vacations and. That's actually my daughter's birthday today. My youngest daughter just turned five today. So Aww. I like being being present and not being away and like being able to do the birthday cake. And when I was a touring musician, uh, I was away a lot. So yeah, that's, that makes sense. Yeah. And just to give listeners some perspective gear, you recently shared on Twitter. How many listens was your most popular song on Spotify? It was uh, well, we could check right now, but it's I think it's over 30 million. So, my, um, yeah, so that's let's just... see. I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. Let's see what it says. I, 31 million and 700,000 listens blows my mind too. Every time I see the number go up, it's like, ah! that is just insane. That, that is, well, congratulations on that. And congrats on, uh, Thanks. on all the great work you're doing with Chessable. So again, a lot of people listening know where to find you on Twitter. Um, the, where else can they, can they reach out to you gear? Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can put my email address in the, in the, uh, the show description there in the course, uh, or yeah, the show description, and uh, otherwise, just at, at Black Atlantic on Twitter. That's my main main one. I've, I've 
done away with all of my other social media because it was too much distraction, but I love chess Twitter too much. So I'm, yeah. I'm still on Twitter. I'm with you. Yeah. And by the way, I, sh- I should say I'm happy to report Chessable is going to be doing some, some consistent ads on Perpetual Chess this year, which is absolutely huge for me. So thanks, thanks to you guys um, and listeners. That means that, of course, that means that I get to endorse a product that, that I love. Um, I don't have to like sling, uh, you know, alcohol and firearms and tobacco to you guys. <laughs> um, and of course, that means we'll be able to keep you posted here a little bit. If there's something coming down the pike from Chessable that I think that we think is worth your attention, uh, there'll be a short little ad that, that can announce it. So just wanted to have full disclosure about that. But it's much appreciated, Gear. Yeah, yeah. Very happy to uh, give you some sponsorship and uh, to uh, be able to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, give our courses a little bit more expo- exposure on your on your great podcast. You know, we're big fans, so it's just a, a good, 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 uh, good to be part of that. Okay, well, thanks again, Gear, and we look forward to everything that you guys cook up in the coming year. And good luck with your chess as well. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, for making Perpetual Chess happen. I also want to thank all you guys and girls who help me grow Perpetual Chess. That includes everyone who tells a friend about the show, everyone who writes a positive review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, whatever other podcast platform you may be on. All of it is appreciated and all of it keeps me going. But of course, most of all, I want to thank the people who provide financial support to the show. I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities they are chessable quality chess books the capital city chess club the apprentice twitch channel andrew bach austin clough benjamin porto kathy carr chad oliver dan o'hanlon danny davidson david schreiber i am dimitri schneider faras sawaf gary foreman greg natel greg shahadi guvin manet jens green john jernigan john cromarty john mccarthy kelly palmer kevin o'callaghan Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, the Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Kahn, FM Michael Oplin, Mike Zelazny, Moonmaster 9000, Peter Sodi, Reuven Fisher, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of Strong Chess, and Todd Kennedy. And I would also like to thank the following people and entities. They are... Aaron Waffler, Ace Fayega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Terakov, Andrew Perry, Better Chess Training, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach Day's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess Federation, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Alec Donnie Ariel, the Fox Valley Chess Club of Aurora, Illinois, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shute, Harish Srinivasan, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Moore, Jason Anfang, Jason Woolham, J. Deep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Jerry Wells, J.J. Stranod, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jordan Goodwin, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Kapala Krishnan, Larry Ryforth, Laura Belyovsky, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwalder, WGM, Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komonich, Tony Rotella, Tyrin Price, Victor Vrinkouj, Wayne Beam, William Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, Zhivko Stoyanov, and that is everyone. Thanks, everyone. Catch you guys next week.